SpaceX is accelerating towards Starship Flight 12, and the pace right now is unlike anything we've seen in the program so far. Block 3 hardware is rising fast, Pad 2 is getting ready for orbital launches, and Pad 1 is being torn down and rebuilt at breakneck speed. Let's break down everything in detail. Ship 39, the first Block 3 Starship, is coming together inside Megabay 2. SpaceX recently integrated the methane downcomer into the stacked tank section, leaving only the aft dome and flaps to complete the vehicle's primary structure. Heat shield tiles are being installed in parallel, and technicians are finishing internal outfitting, routing hydraulic, pneumatic, electrical, and avionic systems. Once these subsystems are tied in, Ship 39 will be ready for cryogenic proof testing. The new Block 3 cryogenic test stand was moved from the Sanchez site to the production area early Thursday morning. This upgraded stand is designed specifically for the Block 3 upper stages, which means Ship 39 is nearly ready for its first cryogenic proof test, the first cryo campaign ever performed on a Block 3 vehicle. On the super heavy side, Booster 18 was fully stacked in Mega Bay 1 a few days ago, and teams are finalizing its electrical, plumbing, and hydraulic work. SpaceX's Vice President of Launch, Kiko Donchev, confirmed that Flight 12 is targeted for January, with cryogenic proof tests and static fire campaigns for Ship 39 and Booster 18 set to begin within the next few days to weeks. It's a tight timeline, but the current pace suggests internal milestones are aligned with the goal. Flight 12 will also debut the Block 3 vehicle, which introduces major structural and performance upgrades informed by earlier flights. I've covered those changes in detail in previous videos. Check the links in the description for a deeper dive. While the next generation vehicles take shape, ground infrastructure is being overhauled. Pad 1 is deep into demolition as SpaceX rebuilds it for Block 3 operations. Most of the upper mount ring is already gone, along with the internal pipework, electrical routing, valves, clamps, and other hardware that sat inside the mount. The propellant lines beneath the OLM have also been removed, clearing the way for deeper teardown. The booster quick disconnect system has also been dismantled. Its protective hood removed first, followed by the complete BQD assembly. After the ring is fully cut and removed, demolition will shift to the launch mount support legs. A thick layer of dirt was recently spread over the water-cooled steel plate beneath the OLM. This plate formed the core of the deluge system, releasing high-flow water through its perforations to absorb thermal and acoustic loads during liftoff. The dirt protects it from debris and heavy equipment during demolition. SpaceX may want the plate removed intact because its precision machine structure and reinforced framing can be repurposed for engine testing at McGregor or retained as a reference piece for future pad hardware. Parallel to the launch mount teardown, the tower is undergoing a significant overhaul. SpaceX removed the chopstick hoist cable system three weeks ago, and last week they detached the main draw works drum. All signs point to a complete lifting system upgrade, likely a higher capacity, higher precision draw works designed for heavier Block 3 vehicles, improved vertical control during stacking, and faster catch response. SpaceX also appears to be preparing to shorten the chopstick arms to match the refined design at Pad 2. Over the past few weeks, workers have cut away components, installed temporary lifting lugs, and prepared the arms for trimming. A shorter arm design reduces bending loads, improves rigidity, and gives tighter control during lift and catch operations. Around Pad 1, ground support systems are being modernized in parallel. The berm wall between the tank farm and launch pad has been demolished to make room for a reinforced blast wall. Crews continue removing old pumps, heat exchangers, propellant lines, and auxiliary tanks as the tank farm is upgraded for Block 3 needs. Once demolition is complete, Pad 1 will be rebuilt to mirror Pad 2's modern layout, meeting the safety and performance standards required for rapid, high-frequency Block 3 operations. While Pad 1 is being torn down, Pad 2 is approaching operational readiness. Teams continue running extension and retraction tests of the dual booster quick disconnect system to validate new propellant transfer hoses, confirm alignment, and verify actuator stroke accuracy before final BQD panel installation. The final segments of both booster quick disconnect hoods were delivered on Wednesday night and will be installed soon, fully enclosing the upgraded BQD assemblies and completing their structural protection. Propellant lines from the tank farm to the mount were also purged to ensure flow cleanliness and readiness for cryogenic loading. 
One system on pad two that has never been tested until now is the booster hold down clamp assembly. The mechanism that locks super heavy to the pad during pre-launch operations and high thrust static fire tests. Recently, SpaceX lowered a new test fixture labeled ibuprofen into the OLM. It's a purpose-built structural rig designed to interface directly with Pad 2's upgraded clamp geometry and load test the system using hydraulic actuators. Pad 1 used a completely different mass simulator nearly three years ago, before Flight 1's first full stack. Pad 1's clamps grab the booster from below, but Pad 2's redesigned system locks into openings in the booster's aft skirt, creating a far stronger, more secure attachment and requiring an entirely new load test article. Ibuprofen provides the rigid structure the clamps need to engage, letting engineers verify load capacity, timing, stroke uniformity, and failure mode behavior long before a fully fueled booster ever rolls onto pad two. With the fixture in place, clamp testing could begin at any time. The last major component still awaiting installation is the ship quick disconnect arm. It's in final assembly at the Sanchez site, where teams are pre-fitting propellant lines, actuators, and electrical systems before mounting it on the tower. With the hinge hardware already installed, arm installation should begin soon. Once the SQD arm is mounted and the remaining tests are complete, Pad 2 will be fully outfitted and ready to support the first Block 3 launch campaign, starting with Flight 12. At the Kennedy Space Center, construction of the nearly identical Starship pad at LC-39A is accelerating. The orbital launch mount was placed on the pad last week, and teams have already begun post-installation work to bring it online. Over the next few weeks, the booster hold-down clamps, QD systems, and remaining plumbing, hydraulic, and electrical hardware will be mounted. On the launch tower, workers have installed the new Drawworks drum and are assembling the lifting chain that links it to the chopstick arms. Once finished, the arms will undergo full functional testing, side-to-side -side translation, full height lifts, synchronized movement, and heavy water bag load tests, similar to the campaigns completed at Starbase. The ship QD arm for LC-39A, now nearing completion at Roberts Road, will also be installed soon. Back at Starbase, Massey's test site reconstruction continues at a steady pace following the Ship 36 incident. The ship test stand is receiving internal hardware, including the new Block 3 hold-down clamps, and teams have installed the Block 3-style ship QD on the gantry to supply propellants during static fire tests. The methane tank farm rebuild is nearly complete, with storage tanks, pumps, heat exchangers, valves, and associated hardware already in place. Propellant transfer lines to the test area and the control systems inside the fluids bunker are progressing in parallel. The liquid oxygen pipeline connecting the oxidizer farm to the test area is also being finalized. At the current pace, Massey's should be ready to host Ship 39 and Booster 18 cryogenic and structural tests as early as next month. And if that schedule holds, Starship Flight 12 remains on track for a January launch. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. NASA's Escapade mission lifted off on Blue Origin's New Glenn rocket, kicking off a bold new chapter in low-cost planetary exploration. Escapade, short for Escape and Plasma Acceleration and Dynamics Explorers, is part of NASA's Simplex program, which develops small, affordable spacecraft for standalone planetary missions. The rocket carried the twin 550-kilogram satellites, Escapade Blue and Gold, on a coordinated mission to investigate Mars's atmosphere and magnetic environment. After a smooth ascent, New Glenn completed stage separation about three minutes into flight. The first stage flipped and began its return sequence, relighting three of its seven BE-4 engines for the re-entry burn to slow through the upper atmosphere. Guided by onboard navigation and control surfaces, the booster then descended toward Blue Origin's landing ship, Jacqueline, in the Atlantic. It relit three BE-4s again for the landing burn and touched down with impressive precision, marking the first successful New Glenn landing, achieved on only the rocket's second orbital mission. SpaceX, the only other company to recover an orbital class booster, took seven attempts before its first intact Falcon 9 landing in 2015. New Glenn, despite a failure on its debut earlier this year, nailed a pinpoint barge landing on Flight 2, showing a level of early reliability few expected. Meanwhile, the upper stage continued to orbit, released the escapade probes at the planned altitude, and the spacecraft began their long journey toward Mars. Because the next Earth-Mars home and transfer window doesn't open until December next year, NASA adopted an alternative trajectory. 
escapade will first enter an orbit around the second Sun-Earth Lagrange point, about 1.5 million kilometers from Earth, the same deep space region occupied by the James Webb Space Telescope. This early launch and wait strategy avoids delaying the mission by an entire launch cycle, demands minimal station-keeping fuel, and also lets the probes begin useful science early by collecting pristine solar wind data in an undisturbed environment. The spacecraft will hold at L2 for about a year, then depart in November next year with a series of maneuvers, including an Earth gravity assist flyby to set their final trajectory to Mars. After an 11-month cruise, the probes are expected to reach Mars in September 2027. They will enter highly elliptical capture orbits, which will be gradually lowered and circularized over six months until they reach their final science orbit for full mission operations. Escapade's first science objective is to map Mars's hybrid magnetosphere, a system shaped by two magnetic sources. One part comes from the solar wind, which drapes its magnetic field around Mars, compresses the upper atmosphere, and drives ionospheric currents that create a large induced magnetic bubble. Beneath it, Mars carries its own crustal magnetic patches, remnants of an ancient global magnetic field that got locked into the rocks when the planet cooled, adding small pockets of localized shielding. Where the draped solar wind field meets and mixes with these crustal patches, it opens pathways that let charged particles from the upper atmosphere escape into space. By flying in formation and sampling different regions at the same time, Escapade can separate the effects of the solar wind and crustal fields and determine how each contributes to atmospheric loss. The mission's second goal is to measure how the solar wind injects energy and momentum into Mars's upper atmosphere, heating and accelerating ions upward and driving atmospheric escape. Over billions of years, this steady energy input thinned Mars's once dense atmosphere, lowering surface pressure and greenhouse warming, and erasing the conditions that once allowed liquid water to exist. The third goal is to study the boundary where the upper atmosphere transitions into space, a collisional layer where atoms and ions still strike one another before escaping. This region controls how Mars's own atmospheric processes prepare particles for escape, even before the solar wind accelerates them. Each probe carries four science instruments to study Mars's space environment, with the primary science campaign running from June 2028 to May 2029. The combined dataset will sharpen our understanding of how the planet evolved and help future mission planners prepare for the radiation and environmental challenges human explorers will face on Mars. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.